Okay, this is going to be kind of an unscripted video about printed circuit boards. So if you've uh, created a project on a breadboard or just using an Arduino and some sensors stuck to it, uh, you know, that that's probably not a, a sustainable solution if you want to make something that's durable or, uh, you know, has not going to have wires falling out. So what's the next step? It would be making a circuit board either making it yourself or having it fabricated at what's called a PCB fab, the, the factory that makes circuit boards. So the first thing is, what is the circuit board? Um, this is a picture of a circuit board, and you can see that there are kind of like a distinct way that they look, right? They're usually green. They've got some metal showing. And um, actually, maybe this isn't an ideal one. Let's, let's look at this one. This is a little closer to reality. So what we've got is... Um, We've got a, a, a circuit board that components get soldered to. These are surface mount components, meaning that they sit on top of the board and uh, get soldered to the top of the board. The alternative is that we also have uh, through hole components. So uh, components with legs that go through holes in the board and then get soldered on the back. And uh, a circuit board could be a combination of the two, but uh, those are kind of two distinct ways that we attach things to the circuit board. The idea is if you've used a breadboard or you have wires hanging around that the traces on the circuit board, we either call them traces or routes, um, those take the place of the wires or the, uh, the metal that's hidden inside the breadboard and make the connections that way. So it's a more uh, permanent solution, doesn't have wires that hang out. It um, it's, uh, allows for really more complex designs like this one where there are a lot of different routes going different places. Uh, in addition to the kind of uh, through hole situation where we have these big holes that uh, legs from the components go through and get soldered on the back, we also have something called vias. So you can see here that there are just these little tiny circles and some of these lines, these routes or traces end at a circle. And you can kind of see in this image that it's uh, this, this copper line is ending, but then it's beginning as a darker one. So uh, if we look at the way that um, PCBs work, this is uh, an image of what's called a stack up. So it tells you like all of the layers of the circuit board. And so there's a, um, a core or some kind of substrate material in the middle, and it's basically a sandwich around that. So it's something like fiberglass or uh, some other material that isn't conductive. And then on uh, the top side of the board, it has um, these copper traces. So that's these raised parts. Uh, they are green in here because, um, and so is the, the non-copper part. And that's because there's something called solder mask applied to the board. So on the very top is solder mask. That's the green part. Then underneath that is some copper traces in certain places. And then there are places, uh, if we look back over here, there are some places where the copper is actually showing or the or the plating, maybe it's gold plating, that happens sometimes too, um, that's actually showing. And this is uh, essentially a continuation of these lines, but the solder mask is not covering that part. So, um, and then, then we have the same thing happening on the other side of the board in the case of a double layer circuit board like this. Uh, you can see from these other images that layers can, their circuit boards can have many layers actually, the layers, um, on the top and the bottom, and then also some inside the circuit board. But that's not something that we deal with. We definitely aren't in the beginning as hobbyists or artists dealing with eight-layer boards or even four-layer boards. Usually two is enough. Um, if we're not having them made at a fab and we're making them ourselves, like on the milling machine or um, by using some other technique like etching a circuit board uh, ourselves with chemicals, then you know we're going to try and keep it as a one-sided circuit board, and we won't even have the the double-sided that's described here. The other thing that is showing in this image is that there's a you know a hole going through from the top to the bottom, and you can see that it's cut away to show that it's it's not only a hole, it's a plated hole. So it's kind of like a um, a uh, tube that goes from the top to the bottom, so the copper actually carries from one side to the other. And that's what these little dots are here. They're called vias, and it basically allows it to uh, move from the top side of the board to the bottom. Okay, so that's that's what circuit boards are. That's how they work. Eventually, they get components placed on them. Uh, these are all surface mount components, and because they're so tiny, it's possible that you'd have those also uh, placed and soldered at the fab, and that's called assembly. So 
You can you can use different companies. Osh Park is a favorite of mine. They make boards in the United States. Um, the end game for um, designing a circuit board is that you end up with Gerber files, and you can just drop the Gerber files here on the Osh Park website, and they will um, give you a price, and you can just get a board back at your house in no time. Um, also, other companies like JLC PCB. Um, they basically are in China and they will also create a circuit board, but they'll also do things like uh, assemble the board for you as well. So you'll you'll get a board back with all the components already soldered onto it. And they have all the components there, so you just choose them. They also do some other fancy things, um, and so does Osh Park. They have other options. So uh, they both work differently, the way that they take orders, the, the speed at which they arrive, and that kind of thing. So uh, you have different choices. How do you make these things? The first thing is uh, we need some kind of software. It's called EDA software. And we can use things like KiCad, uh, which is an open source um, package that people like. Uh, I've never used it. Uh, there's also uh, Eagle, which, oh, Eagle PCB. Um, this is software that I used for about a dozen years. It was uh, a separate company from Autodesk, but then Autodesk purchased it, uh, I guess in 2016, it says. And then at some point, they just kind of did away with it and made it into part of Fusion. So in addition to doing 3D modeling and other things, Fusion also does um, EDA or um, electronics stuff. So what does EDA software do? Um, oh, there's also another one that's worth noting is um, Easy EDA. So... Easy EDA is nice because it's also free and works in a web browser. This actually belongs to JLC PCB, that company that I showed you earlier. So uh, it's really kind of integrated with, with that service. And um, you can go right from this free software to uh, having them fabricate the board all in, in one kind of stream. So um, what does EDA software do? It has uh, a couple of functions and they all kind of do the same thing. They they allow you to do what's called schematic capture, meaning that you draw a diagram of the circuit that you're dealing with. If you look at this one, it's kind of involved, right? Like there's lots of components. There are passive components. There are chips that do specific things. And I will say that, especially for hobbyists and artists, what you find is that you're mostly dealing with, in any design that you come up with, with um, microcontrollers. And so a lot of the complexity of analog electronics and a lot of the mystery that happens with things like inductors and transist transformers is um and we've got both in this uh in this diagram uh all of that is kind of abstracted out for the most part as we deal more with software so uh for a lot of the designs that we'd come up with we're we've got a, a microcontroller on there and maybe a handful of other components and it doesn't have to be super complex like it might have been in say the 70s or the 80s i don't know so in addition to schematic capture, you draw this out using the actual components, right? There's a resistor and that needs to correspond to an actual thing on the circuit board. And that's the other half of it is PCB layout. So it takes what you drew in the schematic and then allows you to lay it out in a circuit board. And then you go from there to Gerber, file, Gerber files. And if we look at, uh, well, there's there's free software that's kind of handy uh, called Gerb View, And I think it works on any uh, computer really, but it allows you to look at all the different layers of um, of a of the Gerber files, and what you can, what you'll find is that the separate layers kind of correspond to uh, what we see on the circuit boards themselves. So, for example, uh, let's find another circuit board here. We've got um, remember that we have the. Uh, we have the copper traces on there on the top half of the board. We have solder mask to place. We have uh, markings here. You can see in white shows where the components are and what their values are sometimes. though That's a silk screen. So there are lots of different layers and each one of them has, has a separate layer in the Gerber files. And um, luckily this is kind of a thing that's shared across all of the different EDA software packages. So whichever one you choose is going to work just fine. The one that I use these days is called DipTrace. It works on Windows, supposedly works on a Mac, but it is Windows software, so that's probably the best place. It doesn't work on Linux. Um, that was one of my favorite things about Eagle, but then when Autodesk 
put it into Fusion, um, that was no longer an option. Linux wasn't a choice and uh, neither is Mac. It only runs on Windows now. So um, that's why I sort of abandoned it. Ironically, I ended up with something that only runs in Windows uh, for the most part, but I, but I like it because it works uh, pretty simply. 